Section 12 of The Destination of Man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte Translated by Jane Sinnott This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12 Faith Beyond Good and Evil the greatest and most terrible disorders are not however the effects of natural causes but of freedom itself man is the cruelest enemy of man lawless hordes of savages still wander over vast wildernesses man meets his fellow man as a foe and perhaps triumphs in devouring him for food where civilization has succeeded in uniting these wild hordes and subjecting them to the social law they attack each other as nations with the power which law and union has given them defying toil and danger and privation armies penetrate forests and cross wide plains till they meet each other and the sight of their brethren is the signal for mutual murder armed with the most splendid inventions of human ingenuity hostile fleets traverse the ocean through waves and storms man rushes to meet man upon the lonely inhospitable sea to destroy each the other with their own hands amidst the raging of the elements in the interior of states where men seem to be united in equality under the law it is for the most part only force and fraud which rule in her venerable name and this kind of war is so much the more shameful that it is not openly declared to be such and the party attacked is not aware of the necessity of defence smaller associations rejoice aloud in the ignorance the folly the vice and misery of the greater number of their brethren and make it confessedly their object to retain them in this condition in order to prolong their subjection no movement towards its amelioration can anywhere be made without raising up a host of selfish interests to war with the mover who must be prepared to see the most various and contradictory opinions leagued together against him in common hostility the good cause is ever the weaker for it can be loved for itself alone the bad attracts each individual by the promise most seductive to him whilst the clash of contending interests is hushed in one common opposition to the good wherever it is found scarcely indeed is such an opposition needed for air misunderstanding and distrust divide even the good and the divisions are widened by the earnestness with which each strives to carry out his own views of what is best and thus is dissipated and lost the strength which even if united would hardly suffice to hold the scale even one blames the other for rushing with stormy impetuosity towards his object without waiting till time should have opened the way to it whilst the other blames him for hesitation and cowardice for allowing things to be done contrary to his better conviction and for never regarding the present moment as the right one for action the omniscient alone can determine which of the disputants is in the right every one regards the point to which he has devoted himself and which he best understands as the most important and necessary the point where all reform must begin he requires all to unite with him for the execution of his particular object and regards it as treason to the good cause if they refuse thus do all good intentions among men appear to be lost in fruitless strivings whilst in the meantime all goes on as well or as ill as it would do without these struggles by the mere blind mechanism of nature thus is it now but thus shall it not be for ever or human life would be an idle game without meaning and without end 
those savage hordes shall not always remain savage no race can be born with all the capacities of perfect humanity yet destined never to develop these faculties or to become more than a sagacious animal might be those savages are destined to be the progenitors of generations of powerful civilized and virtuous men or their existence would be without an object the most cultivated nations of modern times are the descendants of savages whether human society naturally tends towards this cultivation or that the first impulse must be given by instruction and example from without and the original source of all human culture must be a revelation from above by the same path whatever it may be which former savage tribes have followed may the present also attain it they must no doubt pass through the same perils of a first merely sensual civilization with which society is still struggling but they will nevertheless be brought into association with the great whole of humanity and be enabled to take part in its further progress it is the destiny of our race to become united into one great body thoroughly connected in all its parts and possessed of similar culture nature and even the passions and vices of man have from the beginning tended towards this end a great part of the way towards it is already passed and we may surely calculate that it will in time be reached let us not ask of history if man on the whole be yet become more purely moral to a more extended comprehensive power he has certainly attained although as yet this power has been too often perhaps necessarily misapplied neither let us ask whether the intellectual and ascetic culture of the antique world concentrated on a few points may not in degree have excelled that of modern days the answer might be a humiliating one and it might appear that in these respects the human race had rather retrograded than advanced in the course of time but let us ask at what period the existing culture has been most widely diffused and distributed among the greatest number of individuals and we shall doubtless find that from the beginning of history to our own day the brightness of those few points has been extending in wider and wider circles and that one individual after the other one nation after the other has been illuminated and that the light is spreading further and further under our own eyes this is the first station point of humanity on its endless path until this has been attained until the existing culture of every age has been diffused over the whole inhabited earth and every people be capable of the most unlimited communication with the rest must one nation after another one continent after another be arrested in its course and sacrificed to the great whole of which it is a member its stationary or retrogressive age when that first point shall have been attained when thought and discovery shall fly from one end of the earth to the other and become the property of all then without further interruption without halt or regress our race shall move onward with united strength and equal step to a perfection of culture to describe which thought and language fail in the interior of those associations formed rather by fortuitous circumstances than by reason called states after they have subsisted for a time when the resistance excited by new oppression has been lulled to sleep and the fermentation of contending forces appeased abuse by its continuance and by general endurance assumes a sort of permanent form and the ruling classes in the uncontested enjoyment of the privileges they have gained have nothing more to do than to extend them further and to secure also this extension urged by this insatiable desire they will continue these encroachments from generation to generation and never cry hold 
enough till the measure of oppression shall be full and despair give back to the oppressed what centuries of injustice had deprived them of courage to claim they will then no longer endure any among them who cannot be content to be on an equality with others as a protection against reciprocal injustice or new oppression all will take on themselves the same obligations their deliberations in which every one shall decide whatever he decides for himself and not for one subject to him whose sufferings will never reach him and in whose fate he takes no concern these deliberations in which no one can hope to be the one to commit an injustice but every one must fear that he may suffer it these deliberations which alone deserve the name of legislation unlike the ordinances of a league of lords to the numerous herds of their slaves these institutions will be necessarily just and will lay the foundation of a true state in which each individual by the care for his own security will be compelled to pay regard to the security of others since every injury attempted must infallibly recoil on him who attempts it by the establishment of this true state and of a firm inward peace is at the same time foreign war at least with other true states become impossible in order to avoid doing injury to its own citizens by accustoming them to injustice violence and robbery and pointing out other roads to gain than those of diligence and activity every true state will as severely prohibit as carefully prevent or as exactly compensate and as severely punish an injury to the citizen of a neighboring state as to one of its own this law concerning the security of neighbors is a necessary one to every state that is not an association of robbers and by this means is every just complaint of other states prevented and every case of necessary defense among nations entirely obviated there will be no longer necessary permanent and intimate relations of states as such with each other which might lead to strife but usually only of individual citizens with individual citizens a state can be injured only in the person of one of its citizens and the injury is atoned for by immediate compensation between such states as these is no rank to insult no ambition to offend no officer of one state can be entitled to mingle in the internal affairs of another nor could he hope to draw the smallest advantage from any influence he could so obtain that a whole nation should determine for the sake of plunder to make war on a neighbor is impossible for in a state where all are equal the plunder could not be the portion of some few but must be divided amongst all and the share of no individual could ever repay the cost of the war to him only where all the advantage falls to the oppressor and all the toil and suffering to the numerous herd of his slaves is a war of this nature possible and conceivable states like these could have nothing to fear from states resembling them but merely from savages or barbarians who unskilled to enrich themselves by industry would fain do so by war or from nations of slaves driven by their masters to a war from which they will reap no advantage as to the first every individual state must by the arts of civilization necessarily be the stronger against the latter it is the obvious policy of all to strengthen themselves by union it is evidently dangerous to the tranquillity of free states to suffer others to exist as their neighbors to whom wars of conquest might be advantageous and it is therefore to their interest to see all around them free and to extend for their own states the victories of civilization over barbarism of freedom over slavery 
soon will the nations civilized by them find themselves placed in the same relation towards others still enslaved and compelled to pursue towards them the same course of conduct and thus of necessity by the existence of some few really free states the diffusion of civilization freedom and universal peace embrace the whole globe thus from the establishment of a just and upright internal government and of peace between individuals will necessarily follow integrity in the external relations of states and universal peace among them the establishment of a just and upright internal government however and the liberation of the first nation that shall be really free must be the necessary consequence of the increasing pressure of the dominant classes upon those beneath them and the operation of this cause may be safely left to the passions and the blindness of those classes even notwithstanding all warnings they may receive in these only true states all temptation to evil will be taken away and there will be every possible inducement to every man to direct his will to what is good no human creature ever loved evil for the sake of evil but only the advantages and enjoyments he hoped from it and which in fact in the present condition of humanity do sometimes result from it as long as this condition shall continue as long as a premium shall be set on vice no thorough reformation of mankind as a whole can ever be looked for but in a social constitution such as we have imagined evil conduct will offer no advantages nay rather will be certainly prejudicial and by the operation of self-love itself will the extravagances of self-love in unjust actions be repressed by the institutions of such a state will every injury to others every encroachment on their rights not merely be vain but assuredly prejudicial to him who should make the attempt in his own country out of his country on the whole earth he shall find no one whom he can injure with impunity no one will resolve on wickedness which he can never execute and which can produce nothing but his own damage the use of liberty for evil purposes is taken away man must resolve either to renounce his free agency and become a mere passive machine in the great whole or to employ it for good and thus in soil thus prepared will good easily prosper when men shall be no longer divided by a selfish separation of interests and their powers exhausted in a struggle with each other nothing will remain for them but to turn their united strength against their common antagonist a resisting still uncultivated nature no longer distracted by private ends they will unite for a common object and form one body everywhere animated by the same spirit and the same love every loss to the individual is a loss to the whole every step forward made by one man is a step forward for his race the strife of good and evil is abolished for the evil finds no place the strife of the good between themselves is abolished for each regards what is good for its own sake and not because he is the author of it that the truth should be discovered that the useful actions should be done is all important not at all by whom it shall be done every one is ready to join his strength to that of others to become subordinate to others and whoever is most capable will be supported by all and his success rejoiced in by all with an equal joy this then is the object of our earthly existence which reason sets before us and for the infallible attainment of which she is our warrant 
this is not merely the goal towards which we must all strive that we may exercise our powers on something great that is never to be realized it shall it must be realized as surely as a sensuous world and a race of reasonable beings exist in time and for whose existence no serious and rational purpose but this is conceivable if all human life be merely a spectacle for a malignant spirit if this inextinguishable longing after the eternal and imperishable this ceaseless pursuit of what forever escapes us this restless hurrying forward in an ever revolving circle be merely a mocking jest shall not a wise man refuse to play his part in such an idle pageant and the moment of awakening reason be the last of his earthly life if this shall not be then is this end an unattainable one it is attainable in life and through life and reason herself is the pledge to me for its attainment in commanding me to live End of section 12.